Landing a giant spacecraft is one of the craziest challenges SpaceX is taking on. Throughout the history of rocketry, no one, until SpaceX, had ever mastered the art of landing an orbital-class rocket. They pulled it off with Falcon 9, even with the mighty Falcon Heavy, and made it look like a piece of cake. But landing Starship? That's a whole different story. Its sheer size, power, and legless design make full reusability and order of magnitude more difficult. Yet somehow, SpaceX believes they've found a way to make landing this monster easier than ever. So, what exactly are they planning to pull this off? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. In today's space industry, there are three gigantic rockets that truly dominate in terms of scale and power. Each one, a bold symbol of humanity's ambition to conquer the cosmos. First, we have Starship. SpaceX's pride and the company's biggest bet yet. Standing about 123 meters tall when fully stacked, it's an absolute giant, both in size and power. And what's even more exciting is that this number will only grow in the future. Next comes NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS, standing 98 meters tall and built to carry astronauts back to the moon under the Artemis program. And finally, there's China's Long March 10. It hasn't launched yet, but it's expected to reach around 114 meters when completed, a serious contender aiming to challenge Starship's dominance. But if you put all three side by side, Starship easily outshines them all. Not because it's the tallest, but because it's designed to be fully reusable, something no other super heavy rocket has ever achieved. But as of now, Starship's reusability is still just a goal, something SpaceX is still struggling to fully achieve. And the biggest challenge standing in the way? Landing Starship. Of course, when we talk about landing, we're not referring to those splashdowns in the ocean. SpaceX has done plenty of those already. What we're talking about is landing right at Mechazilla, where two massive chopsticks will catch Starship in midair, holding it suspended above the ground. This bold approach is meant to drastically cut down turnaround time, making it possible to prepare for the next flight faster than ever before. Yeah, SpaceX hasn't nailed it yet with the Starship upper stage, but this new landing approach has already been proven with the Super Heavy booster. They managed to bring it down right onto the tower during Flight 5, Flight 7, and Flight 8, and they made it look almost effortless. So, why not do the same with Starship, right? Well, not so fast. Unlike Super Heavy, which only spends a few minutes in flight before returning to land, Starship has to survive the harsh environment of space for more than an hour, facing vacuum, extreme temperatures, and intense radiation. The real nightmare begins during re-entry, when the ship slams into the upper atmosphere and gets engulfed in waves of superheated plasma. That plasma can sneak into tiny gaps between tiles or panels, potentially damaging the heat shield or even the structure itself, if anything isn't perfectly designed. By the time Starship returns for the catch, it's already in a fragile state, battered by atmospheric drag and violent vibrations. That means Mechazilla has to pull off a near-perfect catch with extreme precision, ensuring the safety of both the vehicle and the ground systems. This challenge isn't just about technology. It's about seamless integration between the spacecraft, its control systems, and the launch tower infrastructure. And the crazy part? SpaceX is getting closer to pulling it off. Just look at Flight 10. Even though Ship 37 suffered some damage to its aft flaps due to a small engine bay explosion, or perhaps because SpaceX intentionally removed a few heat shield tiles, it still managed to return safely and perform a controlled splashdown. That flight proved one thing. SpaceX is almost ready to attempt the first ever Starship tower landing, likely with Starship version 3, a brand new upgrade we might just witness by the end of this year. And the clearest proof of that comes from the latest FAA report on Starship's landing trajectory. The document marks the first step toward approving SpaceX's proposed landing plan, giving us the clearest indication yet that the company is gearing up for full return to launch site operations. In other words, both the booster and the upper stage will soon be landing back at Starbase, instead of splashing down in the ocean or being destroyed after launch. Take a look at this image. It shows Starship's planned landing path, which will cut right across northern Mexico on its way back to Starbase. 
That means SpaceX will have to ensure that people living along this corridor won't be affected, even in the unlikely event that Starship breaks apart during re-entry. According to the conceptual trajectory, Starship is expected to descend over the Pacific Ocean, cross Baja, California, and then fly inland over areas near Hermosillo and Chihuahua, each home to roughly a million residents. From there, the vehicle would continue northward, passing just west of Monterey, a city of more than 5 million people, before crossing the Rio Grande Valley near McAllen and Brownsville, Texas. In the final phase, Starship is planned to descend vertically toward Starbase, slowing down so the launch tower's mechanical arms, the famous chopsticks, could catch it mid-air. The proposed launch and re-entry paths would require temporary airspace closures, potentially delaying or rerouting anywhere from 100 to 200 commercial flights per mission. And because these new return routes cross over Mexico, the closures could stretch across more than 6,600 kilometers of airspace, affecting up to 200 additional flights. While that might sound like a logistical nightmare, the trade-off could be worth it. This plan represents a major leap from SpaceX's earlier recovery methods. Until now, most Starship prototypes have either splashed down in the ocean or been destroyed after flight. Sea landings, while safer for testing, make reuse nearly impossible. Saltwater can corrode engines and key components, leading to costly repairs. Landing back on land would change everything. By bringing Starship home to the launch site, SpaceX could avoid ocean damage entirely, making rapid reuse a realistic goal. For comparison, a Falcon 9 booster that lands on land costs just a few hundred thousand dollars to refurbish, compared to the 50 to 60 million dollars it takes to build a new one. That's a savings of over 90% per flight, the very reason Falcon 9 dominates the satellite launch market. With Starship, SpaceX aims to achieve the same, but on a far bigger scale. If successful, this would mark the dawn of a new era of full rocket reusability, dramatically cutting costs and opening the door to faster, more frequent missions beyond Earth. Now, when we apply the same logic to Starship, the difference becomes even more dramatic. Building a single Starship from brand new materials, engines, and components could easily exceed $100 million per vehicle. Some estimates even put the cost closer to $200 million when you include the Super Heavy Booster and all the Raptor engines, which are far more advanced and powerful than the Merlins used on Falcon 9. But if SpaceX can make Starship truly reusable, just like Falcon 9, that massive cost could drop to around $10 million per flight, mostly covering inspection, refueling, and minor part replacements. That would be an unprecedented level of efficiency in spaceflight. Imagine a rocket capable of sending 100 to 150 tons into orbit for just a few million dollars. For comparison, each flight of NASA's legendary space shuttle carried only 27.5 tons to orbit, at an eye-watering cost of $50,000 to $60,000 per kilogram. In contrast, if Starship achieves its target cost of $10 million per launch, that's roughly $67 per kilogram, an absolutely insane number. And remember, it's fully reusable. This is the same principle that made commercial air travel possible, reusing the same vehicle again and again instead of building a new one for every trip. Yes, SpaceX is literally trying to rewrite the history of rocketry with Starship, but achieving those incredible numbers doesn't come without challenges. Let's go back to Starship's landing trajectory. First, it passes directly over mainland Mexico, meaning international coordination will be required since the vehicle will briefly enter another nation's airspace. The FAA report also notes that this region can have up to 200 aircraft per hour, which is a major concern. If SpaceX eventually launches around 22 missions per year, each one could temporarily disrupt hundreds of commercial flights, adding up to several thousand affected flights annually. Another interesting detail is that the re-entry corridor doesn't end directly over Starbase. Instead, it extends slightly offshore into the Gulf of Mexico. That suggests SpaceX is keeping an ocean landing option as a backup plan, in case something goes wrong. They used a similar approach during Flight 6, when the booster performed a controlled splashdown, rather than targeting the launch pad. It's a smart way to maintain a safety margin while testing new capabilities. Although the FAA map mainly focuses on the final landing phase, we can imagine what the full flight might look like globally. Starship would likely launch eastward, entering orbit over the Atlantic Ocean, 
continuing across the Indian Ocean, possibly passing near Southeast Asia or Australia, then heading over the Pacific before beginning its descent back to Texas. The FAA also mentions that all planned Starship landings will occur during daylight hours, and that makes perfect sense. Starship's re-entry is far more complex than Falcon 9's, involving higher speeds, higher temperatures, and multiple engine burns. Daytime conditions give ground teams and tracking systems better visibility, reducing overall risk. And here's the key part. In the conclusion of the draft report, the FAA clearly states that no significant impacts are expected to result from the proposed action. This serves as a partial green light within the NEPA environmental review process, signaling that the FAA is paving the way for SpaceX to move forward with final approvals and future Starship launches from Starbase. Across the industry, the push toward full reusability is accelerating, and one company leading that effort is Stoke Space. Founded in 2019 by two former Blue Origin engineers, they are developing a fully reusable launch vehicle and recently secured $510 million in new funding, bringing their total to nearly $1 billion. According to the company, this fresh investment is accelerating the development of their Nova Rocket, a medium-lift launch vehicle with both stages designed for full reusability, while also expanding their manufacturing capabilities. Nova is designed to carry up to 3,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit in full reuse mode, or up to 7,000 kilograms in expendable configuration. The rocket aims to fill the gap between smaller launchers capable of lifting around one ton and heavy lift vehicles like Falcon 9 or Vulcan Centaur. Its reusable upper stage could also enable in-space transportation and cargo return missions, something rarely seen in rockets of this class. Progress on NOVA has been moving steadily since earlier this year. Stoke has conducted full mission duty cycle test firings of flight-like engines for both stages, and they're currently working to convert Launch Complex 14 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for NOVA's use. The company says it hopes to complete work at the launch site early next year, though it hasn't yet announced a target date for NOVA's first flight.